Hey everyone! Welcome to part one of our fiction unit. Um, I wanted to start off with a pretty visual for you guys, just a little collage. Um, I just found these pictures online. Uh, for me, you know, fiction is supposed to represent the innermost parts of the imagination, which is why I went creative with some of these pictures I found. So a good place to get started is to give you an overview of terms and also provide examples. Um, and what I want to like, first of all, direct your attention to is the study guide that is on our Canvas page. So if you go to our week one module, you will be able to see a study guide that I created for you. Now, all of these terms, everything that I am covering in these lectures will be in that study guide. So, um, you know, this will help you understand the study guide more. And then I made the study guide just to make studying a little bit easier for you. So if you do want to have um, the study guide open in front of you and as you're looking at the term and as we discuss the term, you might want to take notes. That's actually a great idea. All right, let's get started. So first of all, what's fiction? Um, I put a little definition here. In reference to fiction, we're talking about imaginary stories. So fiction means, you know, you make it up. Nonfiction would be real, which sometimes is confusing for a lot of people. Um, now, just because it's fiction does not mean that it may not have an, any truth to it. There are some fiction stories that are based on a true story. Even if a story is based on reality, we still call it fiction because it is a person's interpretation of that reality. It's a person's imagination um, and it's not the exact, you know, autobiography, biography. Um, it's not like a reporting. It's not, it's not entirely factual. So sometimes, you know, you get like on Netflix, there's a movie and it might say based on a true story. Well, that film is still considered uh, a work of fiction. There's two types. Uh, there's novels and then there's short stories. So we are going to have both. We have a novel near the end of our of our semester and then we will be starting with short stories in our class. Now there's different kinds of short stories but there's unique kinds that um, you know we we won't be reading the first two. We may we may read the third one. So we have fables. These are stories that teach morals. Typically, you know, fables tend to use animals. It's just a little um, little clue. And then we have parables. Uh, these are stories that teach morals, but again, they do it in a different way. It involves people. Now we also have tales, and probably the most um, the popular one is is that you know of is fairy tales. These are stories again that teach morals, um, and they usually include these like over the top outrageous events. Um, you know, Snow White is a fairy tale, and then we have folk tales as well. Um, that's worth mentioning. Like Bluebeard is a folk tale. It's not quite a fairy tale. It goes into the category category of folktale, but a lot of times we use folktales and fairy tales interchangeably. Now, <clears throat> when you're reading a story, it's important to know two words, and this is going to come up, and I'm going to use this vocabulary throughout this class. The two words that are very important to know are the word protagonist and the word antagonist. Now, I wanted to provide two very powerful examples of protagonists and antagonists because uh, the difference is, is very clear cut as you can see in both films. So the protagonist is the main person in a story. Um, I just want to, <laughs> this is a funny little, um, uh, this is a funny little fact. So here's the fact. The protagonist doesn't always have to be a good person. It's just the person telling the story. It's the main person in the story. So um, I think it's fascinating to know that you know, sometimes you might have a protagonist that is not like morally the best person, but it's still the protagonist like Harry Potter and like Batman or Bruce Wayne. 
the antagonist is the character standing in the main person's way. So a lot of times we think of this person um, as, you know, the one that that is the villain or um, just like the one that is causing conflict. Um, obviously, these are very clear uh, villains. We have Voldemort and um, we have Bane. And these are villains who, you know, might have a, a streak of goodness in them. It doesn't even mean that the antagonist is entirely evil. So one, one um, warning I would like to give you is do not just assume that the protagonist equals good and the antagonist equals bad. It's just that the antagonist is the one that is providing conflict um, that runs in the way of the protagonist getting to whatever goal that they're trying to get to. Um, just to let you know, in the Daredevil um, comic, and I was watching the, the Netflix one, which I absolutely love, um, the Punisher is the antagonist in one season. So we have Daredevil being our protagonist and then the Punisher being the antagonist. But then Netflix created another um, show where um, it was all based on the Punisher. And then the Punisher became the protagonist. So isn't it fascinating that depending on what story you're reading, the, um, the antagonist of one story could become the protagonist of another story. So... Um, I want to test this out and see if you guys were able to figure this out after reading the, the story Girl. Um, it's a very short story and it's it's very non-conventional story. The whole story is in the form of dialogue. But after you read the story, who do you think the protagonist is and who do you think the antagonist is? Now, I would like you to maybe press pause on the screen and try to figure it out. Maybe write it down really quickly or just have, have the answer in your mind. Are you ready? Three, two, one, bam. The girl giving, or I'm sorry, the girl receiving the advice is our protagonist. Um, she is the main person in our story. As you can tell, the story is called Girl. The story is about her. It's about her real experience, although she doesn't really have an active role in her own story. And then, of course, the person giving her advice, uh, who we assume might be a mom-like figure, because I don't know this as a fact. We, we don't know this as a fact, but this is what we assume as we read the story. Um, that it's a it's a maternal figure giving the advice. Why do we assume this? Well, it's just natural um, deduction, you know, it, because the person who is giving the advice has experience in what it is she's talking about. Um, and obviously, if she's you know teaching this young woman to be the proper girl, well, then obviously, you know, she has her own experience to back up the advice that she's giving. Um, again, it's not conventional. That's why it's a bit tough, but I wanted to give it as an, as an example just to see if you guys caught on. All right. This is the last um, lesson that I would like to give for unit one of um, our fiction slideshow. Um, it's important to know the plot. So we, we learned a little bit about protagonists and antagonists. Now, let's take a moment and, and look at the plot structure of stories. Now, what's a plot? A plot is a series of events in a story. Um, if you really want to summarize the plot of a story, it's not going to be very interesting. It's going to be this happened, and then that happened, and then that happened. It's just going to be events lined up one after the other. But there is always a movement in a story. Always. There's always a beginning and it, it creates the situation. So the exposition is the situation. It's the, um, you know, what it is that this story is about and what is happening in the story that we are going to be watching. So the introductory exposition is going to be knowing who the characters are, uh, maybe, you know, understanding who our protagonist is. At this point, you might even know who the antagonist is. And then being introduced to the conflict. Every single story 
has a conflict. It's also called rising action. And it's this uh, sort of tension that builds in a, in a story. Every story has to have a conflict. And then comes the climax. Now, this is tough to um, map out because the climax is supposed to be the major action that happens right before the conclusion of the story. So it's the, the most important action. Um, if we, in the, in the conflict, in the rising action, have building tension, well, the climax is the breaking of that tension. It's that last big act, that, that big bam that happens, that you're like, oh, you know, <laughs> the big action that happens before the falling action takes place. The falling action is what happens after that major act that really influences the events of the story. Um, and then, of course, our conclusion. Um, <clears throat> it doesn't matter if the story is um, told in a conventional way. A lot of movies nowadays, they sometimes start with the climax and then they give us a, um, a flashback to the exposition. So if they don't give like a linear plot line. But after you are done watching the movie, for example, um, and I'm thinking of uh, the usual suspect is a perfect example of this. If you've seen that movie, um, it, it, you know, it starts with the climax and then it goes back and basically tells us how we got there. But after the movie, you will still be able to fill out this chart because every single story has these elements. They are five elements that the story contains. And of course, depending on the plot chart you're using, there's um, different level of detail um, you know, for each plot chart, but this is the basic component of the plot. And, and basically the plot chart that um, I'm gonna have you guys use. So let me give you an example. Lord of the Rings, my favorite story ever, my favorite movie ever, my favorite series of movies, actually. Now, what's the exposition? The exposition, we know, it starts off with, you know, a hobbit. And at that point, we, we learn who Frodo Baggins is. Um, we learn that Frodo is friends with Gandalf, the great wizard. Um, we also have a pre-story in the film that isn't really in the book. But still, you know, we learn that Frodo has a very peaceful life, that his life is surrounded by nature. He's relatively happy. He does crave adventure every now and then. Then suddenly there is this evil ring that falls into his possession. And this is where the conflict comes into play. We learn that the major antagonist happens to be that evil Lord Sauron who is controlling the ring, who is actually not dead, he's not erased. And Frodo's um, entire journey is to uh, destroy the ring. And that, that's what Fellowship of the Ring is all about. He has these friends and they go on a quest and the quest is to destroy the ring. Now, believe it or not, you know, and I'm talking about the film version, after the climax, the film actually goes on for like another about an hour or 45 minutes or so. So when I say the last major action before um, the story ends, the story might still continue, but that continuation is all falling action. That climax is the big battle on the top of Mount Doom between Frodo and Gollum as they are fighting for the ring. And that, that moment when the ring gets destroyed would be the climax. The falling action would be Frodo going home, uh, basically saying goodbye to his companions, and at the end, Frodo's journey to leave Middle Earth. And that's how the story concludes. Now, I'm giving an example because I, what I'm going to have you do is to do um, this exact plot chart. I'm sorry, not this exact one, but, but two different versions that I created for you guys for another story. 
and um, it's going to be for A&P by John Updike. And if you guys go to our discussion, you will learn more information about what I would like you to do, um, and this will be fabulous practice for all of us. Please let me know if you have questions.